I'm down here in the bottom right corner. <laughs> okay. So I, I would like to share with you an approach, which I think will feel quite consistent with your on, own ongoing work. Um, I'm sharing it as it might be framed around a specific crisis. It is, of course, generalizable to every decade of life, what I'm going to share. But the foundational nature of human spirituality as a source of resilience, renewal, recovery, as foundational to who we are, and um, in the event that our natural spiritual core is not nourished, that is a disintegration of who we are. So I'm going to look at this body of science and frame the broader issues around spirituality, our innate spiritual nature, the protective benefits, specifically around one decade. And I'm doing this because I'd like to draw a link between the body of basic science and the way that this roadmap of who we are as naturally spiritual beings has been engaged and adapted by institutions, by mental health, by the US Army quite extensively. And I'll make along our journey here note of ways in which specific notes of science have been used as a blueprint for institutional transformation. So what is what is the question at hand and what am I looking at? Well, about, I guess, eight, eight years ago, our team published in JAMA Psychiatry an article on the neural correlates of sustained spiritual life over eight years. And what we found at the time were broad and pervasive regions of cortical thickness represented here in red that were associated with sustained spiritual life over eight years in people mean age 38. So people who, whether they were Hindu, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, spiritual, but not religious, said, yes, my personal spirituality is highly important to me, who saw daily life on the bedrock, spiritual bedrock, and for whom spiritual life was for in their understanding of how they coped, in their understanding of who they were. And they said that again, eight years later. Now, what's interesting is that these regions of cortical thickness, which as you know, are essentially processing power, are across the precuneous parietal and occipital regions of perception, reflection, and orientation. And these broad and pervasive regions of strength, if you will, in perception, reflection, and orientation are not thick, but thin in people with recurrent major depression as found by a fellow lab, offering some evidence that sustained spiritual life may be neuroprotective against recurrent depression. We sent this into JAMA. We got a beautiful blind peer review and in fact, every step of the way since 1996, when our lab started this science, we have gotten over 98% blind, beautiful peer reviews. The scientific community has upheld what our job really is, which is to kick the tires, test the method, make sure that the claims are indeed supported by the data. And we have been able to publish along with many of you here today, a great number of articles in this lane of work because of the integrity of the scientific peer review system. We also got back a very interesting suggestion. They said, can you predict anything prospectively? What does cortical thickness across the regions associated with spiritual awareness say about where we are prospectively a year from now? And we did have that data. And what we found was that cortical thickness today is predictive against meaningfully decreased level of depressive symptoms a year out. And that this finding was even more the case in people at high risk. So the more that I am genetically loaded up with familial risk, the more that I might be under the rain cloud of depressogenic thinking or in the throes of stressful life events, the more protective spirituality is against depression prospectively as mediated by its neural correlates. So that really set us thinking. And we stepped back quite a ways and said, well, okay, what else do we know? 
we know that people who say my spirituality is important to me, we published this in the American Journal of Psychiatry about 10 years ago. Those folks who say my personal spirituality is highly important to me are more likely, in fact, two and a half times more likely, 250% more likely to have gotten there over the past 10 years through struggle and depression. Depression from ages 16 to 26 was highly predictive of a strong spirituality during this phase of spiritual individuation, coming of age. And yet once established, a strong spirituality was 75% protective against recurrence, and that went up to 90% in a high-risk family. So the large effect with which we're all familiar that broadly speaking, spirituality is highly protective against depression is the view from the 10,000 foot aerial window of the airplane. But when we look at the human life course, it appears that there's a rich interplay between depression and the strength of our spiritual life. And in fact, it may be that certainly at least in puberty, late adolescence and emerging adulthood, and possibly quite likely based on other data, again, in midlife, we have a different type of depression. It is a developmental depression. The struggle, the existential hollowness, the inability to let go of life's most profound questions that is best not understood as lost time or downtime or a symptom merely to be eradicated, but which is a knock at the door for a deeper look into our lives. Developmental depression. Now in this room, you're probably well aware that if you look at the DSM and you give two highly capable practitioners, the same patient, one on Monday at one, and then again, Monday at three, the rate of agreement is quite high around the diagnosis of schizophrenia, 0.9 around bipolar 0 0.68, 0 0.7. But two highly qualified practitioners agree on the, the diagnosis, agree on the diagnosis of MDD 0.28. That is very low inter-rater reliability. If that were a scale, we'd throw it out. Why? Because as the makers of the DSM are the first to say, there's great heterogeneity within what we call depression. There are likely many different subtypes. And one subtype appears to be developmental depression, which is the call, the knock at the door of spiritual emergence. In this crowd, you know this, but I'm going to share with, this, with you as I would a crowd perhaps less familiar, which is spirituality and religion go hand in hand for about 70% of people in the United States. About 30% of millennials, more with each younger generation, fewer with each older, say I'm spiritual, but not religious. If you ask a scientist, hey, what's the difference between spirituality and religion? One answer might be that religion, as looked at through the lens of twin studies, is 100% environmentally transmitted. Religion is a gift of our parents, our grandparents, the legacy of our ancestors of our community. And it is learned through immersion, through the rich practice and text and language. Spirituality through the lens of a twin study is our birthright, it is innate. Every one of us is born with an innate capacity for spiritual life. And more specifically, while scientists of course don't define spirituality, we can identify threads of a lived human spiritual life which have its origins in our birthright that it can be attributed to broad heritability. And the specifically, the dimension is a transcendent relationship. I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty, yellow circle. When I have a tough decision to make, I ask what really is my higher power showing me? When I am in nature, I know I am one with all life. There is a force in us, through us, and among us. Whether we are Catholic, Hindu, Christian, Jewish, spiritual, but not religious. We are all born with a neuro docking station that you just saw in bright red for transcendent relationship. And when we look even further at the second dimension 
of innate human spirituality, it turned out that the very same neuro docking station through which we experience a relationship with God, Jesus, Hashem, the universe, spirit, whatever magnificent word is that for our creator, is the same neuro docking station through which we experience that love in our relationship for one another as fellow human beings or living beings, relational spirituality. Relational spirituality is our birthright. Why is this of concern and what does it have to do with our pandemic of the diseases of despair, particularly as they press into late adolescence and emerging adulthood? As you know here, there has never been a time in our history where we have faced as elevated rates of addiction, depression, self-harm, and suicide as now in Gen Z. 18 through 25 has become a very dangerous time. We no longer die of cancer. The pandemic for them was not about COVID. The pandemic has been about suicide and the diseases of despair that slowly erode and tear us apart. How do we get there? How did we get there? And what does it have to do with our discussion? Well, 40 years ago in the good attempt to be inclusive, we threw all talk of religion out of the public square in many places across our country. And in fact, in many places across post-industrial global culture, Europe, even parts of the Middle East. What did that mean? Well, 40 years, is long enough for someone to grow up, have a child who grows up and is at our door. They are on our campus. They are in the army. They are in an entry level job. And while some young adults do have a strong spiritual core, never have so many not. Never have so many not had the opportunity to myelinate the tracks, to form what is their birthright into a deep way of sustained being, a seat of perception, not merely a belief or a theory or theology, a deep way of being, the yellow circle, our birthright. Because while indeed the capacity for transcendent relationship is innate, it is one third innate, two thirds environmentally formed. And what looks like suffering at the level of the individual might better be understood as our cultural tidal wave. It no longer makes sense when 48% of Gen Z reports moderate, which is to say clinically moderate. So interfering levels of the diseases of despair. It no longer makes sense to locate at the level of the individual what is clearly in the air and water of our culture and swallowing them up. By way of comparison, one third and eight, two thirds environmentally form. How big is two thirds? Well, our temperament is half innate, half environmentally formed. I have uh, three children and when the middle child who has asked to go by center child was a baby. She slept through the night at 18 months, eh, four times a night, four times a night. I'd walk across the house and I'd soothe the uncomfortable, anxious baby. She now sleeps through the night. She's 20. And she has allowed me to share with you, she's a bit anxious, half innate, half environmentally formed, how we handle and manage our temperament. And that includes the internal environment of contemplative life or prayer. IQ is 60% innate. So you're all very, very smart. You were born smart. 40% developed. The capacity through which we experience a transcendent relationship, two thirds environmentally formed means that our faith community, our treatment community, our pastor, priest, imam, rabbi, our parents and grandparents, and our school, everywhere we go, weighs in to shape the spiritual core, relational spirituality, by how those around us walk the walk and talk the walk, by how we are directly encouraged to foster our own transcendent relationship and live out those values walking the walk. So we have engaged at the level of a campus, Awakened Campus Global. And we have also engaged at the level of the US Army and the Army's model is now being shared with other branches of the military. 
Here's the right now. Innately spiritual beings facing a culture with a pretty empty public square, a public square that's so silent on spiritual life that in many senses, to a very large extent, the public square has become a radically transactional public square, a public square where we know each other as what can you do for me and how well am I doing a transactional relational public square. But the good news is that this period of developmental depression, which exists in any decade over any cohort, whether we came of age in the 60s or we came of age in the 80s or we come of age right now, developmental depression is a window of opportunity. We see that through longitudinal twin studies as marked by a 50% increase in the heritable contribution, which means that a biological clock goes off from the inside out. What is my meaning? What is my purpose? And I don't mean, do I become a doctor or a lawyer or a banker? I mean, my ultimate purpose as a soul on earth. And what is the meaning of life itself? The nagging of the head, the existential questioning. Some are very verbal young people. Some are just frustrated. This is stupid. What's the point of it? Nihilism and the hunger of the heart for deep love, for true love, the disgust with phoniness and hypocrisy and the deep respect for what is loving and true. This is our gift. And in fact, I think of the adolescence, if you think of the change that we make from 18 through 25 in our larger world, whether it was the civil rights movement in 1968 or right now, our new 1968, or whether it was the Arab Spring, there is a passion for what is true and right and spiritually aligned. When we can support spiritual coming of age and the despair that yields to a deep, deeper realization of who we are and life itself and spirit, God, our higher power, the spiritual core is built. And we now know through 20 plus years of peer review science, American Academy and Child and Adolescent um, Psychiatry, and Journal of Adolescent Health, nothing is protective against the pandemic. There's nothing of the individual and there's nothing at the level of the tidal wave, our collective being is profoundly protective against the pandemic of addiction, depression, and even suicide. In a meta-analysis, Wu and colleagues looked at 2,000 tragically completed suicides, 2,000 tragically completed suicides, and 5,000 matched controls in a meta-analysis and found a 62% decreased relative risk of completed suicide that goes up to 82% when spiritual life is shared. Over to you, ISH, this is what you're doing. When you treat someone at this level of a spiritually engaged treatment, it is both not just a recovery, but a, a renewal. We are made bigger inside as the chief of chaplains of the Pentagon says, and it is prevention against the next unwanted trauma or negative life event that might've been depressogenic or traumatizing. We are positioned instead for growth. 70% less likely to drive 90 miles an hour and jump out the second story window. 80% less likely if we are standard deviation above as compared to below the mean to say, remember the two innate dimensions. I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty. We are an open system. What I call an awakened brain. We are in dialogue with the deeper spirit in and through life source who I call God. And we are hardwired to perceive that we are loved and held, guided, and never alone. This is a letter to Bill Wilson, a beautiful letter that was originally brought to my attention by one of my doctoral students, Ryan, Hispanic. And I want to read this beautiful, if you can see it yourself, you may want to read, take a screenshot and read the whole piece. Um, but just right here, I'm strongly convinced that the evil principle prevailing in this world lends the unrecognized spiritual need into perdition if it is not counteracted 
either by real religious insight or by the protective will of human community, collectivism. An ordinary man not protected by an action ran above and isolated in society cannot resist the power of what he calls evil. I would call it an entropic force, which is called very aptly the devil. That would, doesn't happen to be my word either. But the use of such words aroused so many mistakes that one can only keep aloof from them as much as possible. These are the reasons, and he goes on to say, um, his difficulty in working with someone. And at the very bottom, you see alcohol in Latin is spiritus. And you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as for the most depraved poison. And helping formulate, therefore, is spiritus. Oops, let me see. Not spiritum. This is an idea, as you know, was picked up by William James as well earlier on that there is the yes function in humans and that it can be that addiction is the tricky back road to trying to excite natural awakened awareness, natural awakening of our spiritual capacity, but it doesn't work because it's gone the next day and it's the tricky back door. If you think of shoots and ladders that brings us down, but Jung was very well aware of this. And in his correspondence with the founder of AA, was very clear that it is foundationally about a deep spiritual hunger that is fed through authentic spiritual life, spiritum contra spiritus contra spiritum. Developmental depression, the opportunity of that patient's lifetime to find what is authentic spirituality, not to turn to drugs or alcohol or other forms of addiction or to be locked and stay in a state of depression. And I know people who I love very much who never had the complete journey through developmental depression and are really holding, holding for five, 10, 20, 25 years. We are built to grow through struggle, even in its most acute and painful form. This is a study by TSAI, Sci and Colleagues, 3,000 plus vets, and everyone here meets criteria for PTSD. To be here in this study, 3,000 plus vets all met criteria for PTSD with going out the x-axis, increasing levels of symptoms. More anxiety, more reactivity, more sleeplessness, more flashback. Up the y-axis are units of growth. More struggle, more growth. More struggle, more growth more struggle, more growth until we get so far out that we need support to grow. But it is simply the case that struggle is a gateway for spiritual growth, post-traumatic growth. Tadeshi and colleagues looked at the four predictors. How do I get up on that curve? And three will sound familiar, access to the experience, putting it in words, sharing the traumatic moment with a group. But then Tadeshi found shining the light of our transcendent relationship, our innate inborn transcendent relationship. And then I realized, see the siren, can you hear it? Then I realized, important, that I was not to blame. And then I saw that God would forgive me. Then I saw that we could forgive each other. The profound reshuffling of meaning that comes in when the group addresses the painful traumatic memory with prayer. For some in the chaplaincy, it was the laying on of hands. For some, it was more of a visualization. Whatever the pathway is, it invokes the same red brain, the same docking station of housing the transcendent relationship. No biological reductionism. It's a correlation, a transcendent relationship that is our birthright. And on the other side of post-traumatic spiritual growth, we are closer, of course, to our higher power, to spirit or God, mm -hmm. I call God, we are more able to look in the eye, those whom we could not before. My colleague in the Pentagon, Chaplain Soljim, Chief of Chaplains, talks about a member of special operations who doing everything he was told and acting to preserve his life and that of his squad members, burst through a door in the Middle East, was under fire, followed procedure, fired, and took out the person attempting his life, who he then saw was a 13-year-old boy, the same age as his own son. 
And that set him into a deep process of trauma that was only resolved at the level of the spiritual core, post-traumatic spiritual growth. He was able to then, after several years, look his son in the eye. When we strengthen the capacity to move between different forms of perception from what I call awakened awareness and achieving awareness, back and forth, achieving awareness, strategy, tactic, I got it all lined up. We've planned the mission. Here's how we're going to grow as an organization. Here's what we wanted for our family. And when we realize that planning and tactics actually rides on an assumption of radical control that applies 10% of the time, life has dynamism, life has flux, particularly in our field, certainly in the army. Life is dynamic. We can shift from what do I want? How are we gonna to execute to wow, open system. What is life showing me now? What God do you ask of me now? What is being revealed through those who walk with me? These are organic forms of knowing, what I might call organic epistemologies. We have at the inner table of human knowledge and awareness, perception, logic, of course, empiricism, we're all scientists, and two, intuition, the gut instinct, the knowing, just knowing, inner wisdom, mystical experience, profound, whether in dreams or in our mind's eye. And of course, the skeptic. But the skeptic can sit at the table and fuel a deepening of faith, can fuel the pursuit of inquiry. The skeptic is not the bouncer at the door. And when we engage all forms of organic human knowing, we myelinate the sheaths, we literally pave the highways between regions of the brain for a more interconnected, innovative, and in the army, situationally aware brain. Because no matter how well we plan, red door, red door, red door, tactically it's there, red door stuck. We shift, we shift, and we shift in a way that can be a setup for the rest of our lives. We shift from the top down dorsal to the bottom up ventral attention network. We perceive not only do I want it, do I want it? Wow, what is life showing me now? And many people say a new yellow door pops. We shift from I'm alone, I've got to have planned and controlled everything to wow. I am loved and held. If I don't get the job, if I don't get married, I will not fall through the existential hole. I am held, I am loved loved and held the bonding network, guided the shift in attention network. And perhaps one of the strongest findings across numerous articles in this field is that the parietal puts in and out hard boundaries so that we know that we are at once distinct. We have our bio body suit, we have our GPS coordinates, we have our ideas and our red or blue t-shirts politically. And not only are we a point, but we are part of a wave. We are part of one family of life one force, one creation. We are a point and we are a wave. We are one. We are loved and held. We are guided. We are never alone. When we strengthen that and understand that going through a phase of developmental depression, we come out the other side in a way where that endures the rest of our lives. We, once becoming spiritually aware, we have paved the road to go back there at any decade of life. What does that sound like? Well, we invited 18 through 25 year olds into an MRI machine. We said, okay, we know what the end game looks like at mean age 38. We know what stability over decades looks like. But how does this all start? Developmental depression, spiritual awakening. What does that look like in the college student's brain? So we had them come in and we told, said, tell us about a time you were stressed. One way down there. Tell us about a time you were stressed. Tell us about a time you were just chill. And tell us about a time where you felt a deep relational connection to spirit, to God, to your higher power, to the force in life. Well, first of all, nobody was confused. They all knew exactly what we meant when we described relational spirituality. But almost half said, I'm so glad you asked because no one's ever asked me that before. 80% protective against addiction, 82% protective against completed suicide in a pandemic of suicide. And no one's ever asked me that before. 
a public square silent on spiritual life is what I might call at the level of prevention, iatrogenic harm. It is in the same way that we give every child recess with air and sunshine and free lunch, their spiritual core is forming. And what did the spiritual stories sound like? They sounded a lot like post-traumatic spiritual growth, but less severe. I'm walking down the street. I feel like such a loser. I've applied to seven med schools. I've been turned down at six. I'm never going to be a med student. I'm never going to be a doctor like my dad or my mom. But then I looked up and I saw light in the leaves. And I knew that God would make me a healer in the way that I am intended loved and held, guided, never alone. I was so hurt. I was so angry. We'd gone out for three years and I had a promise ring. We were going to be married. And then the week of graduation, he called it off. I felt so ugly. I felt so unlovable. But then sitting in the pews of my childhood house of worship by my parents and grandparents, I looked over and I saw their great love for me and I felt God's love. And then I knew, yes, I'll, I'll love again loved and held, guided, never alone. Awakened awareness is our birthright. The parietal, the bonding network, and the shift from the dorsal to the ventral attention network is our neuro docking station. And when we engage it, we have an entirely different life. John, how am I doing on time? Is it time for me to stop talking or should I do a little bit more? Uh, I have been just loving what you're saying. It's a lot to absorb. What I would say, if you can hear me, is uh, I am very interested in what Dr. Lomax and Carrie Harrell and others in this circle would have to respond at this point. Right. And I think we need to put this on the YouTube, if you will allow it, because it is so powerful. And I'm remembering that football player, Hamill, when he, uh, for the Buffalo uh, Bills, uh, actually died, and then we saw that an entire team, both teams, knelt in the middle of the field to pray for him. I just had to, I, my heart was just so full of joy that in spite of the death that we were watching, that we would be uh, football players, would be kneeling in the middle of a football field, and the, the team didn't want to even continue the game. It was an incredible experience. So when you said 75% of us have, you know, awareness of our spirituality, I think it went up about 10 degrees to anybody who saw that. And I would, uh, have you said, a, do you have a way you want to uh, uh, end this? Or I don't want to stop you. If you got stuff good to show, let's do it. Okay, well, how about if I, I'd love discussion. So how about if I end in two minutes? which is in this work of spiritual individuation, whether in coming of age or again at midlife, there is a whole different way that we come to know ourselves and the purpose and meaning of this beautiful life from the view of the spiritual core versus without a spiritual core. Two different ways of being. Who am I and who are you and what is the nature of life? And a radically transactional, public square minus the spiritual core. Who am I? I'm in the top percent of my class. Who am I? I'm going to Rice. Who am I? I am the most popular boy or girl in the class. I am my parts, my pieces, my performance. In a study of highly resourced high schools, my dear colleague, Dr. Sunil Luther, identified the two predictors of social esteem. What's in this tidal wave? The air and water surrounding young people. The two predictors of popularity, social esteem in girls and boys, I might invite you to kick those around. Who am I and who are you and what is the nature of our lives together? So any guesses, number one predictor of popularity in girls? Good um, looks. It indeed in that bandwidth, it was quite specifically weight, parts and pieces. And the second predictor was not much better. It was actually worse. The second predictor was cruelty, mean girls, like the musical. Interpersonal cruelty to instantiate rank and group. Mm -hmm. Beautiful souls on earth acculturated in a tidal wave. 
parts and pieces, transactional relationships, jockeying up, being pushed down, right? And boys, number one predictor, substance use, not athletics. Amongst the athletes, the ones using substances were more popular. What else could get in your way more than that? And the second was not intimacy, but notches on the belt, exploitation of girls, transactional. We have a public square that needs you. Yes, we need you in treatment. And yes, we need you in prevention, but we need you way over here past well-being in development. You are nodes of your, your torchbearers. And when you speak out in certainly your professional lane, but beyond that in the community and Houston City on the Hill, you're doing this so much more than many places on the natural spiritual nature of our lives and of who we are, as you always do at ISH in a way that's inclusive and loving. You revitalize the air and water of our culture. Because Outside of Palo Alto High School right now, there's a full-time security guard and a fence on the train track. Because after a junior got a C minus, that's it. No Stanford, no Caltech. There's nothing left, parts and pieces. Ryan, New York, same thing. Parents taking back their culture, using our field science right here to change parent culture. Treatment, yes. Prevention, yes. But can we get way upstream of the otherwise downstream atrophied core, the diseases of despair, and the interpersonal relational breach of ethics? Dr. Luther found 17-fold the national rate of sociopathy using people as means in highly resourced high schools who grow up, become low, you know, and run things. So we have our work to do, and it is broad and pervasive. And if I'm a soul on earth, you're a soul on earth. Who are we? Our relationship's about encouragement. On a tough day, it's about forgiveness. But I am not narrowly in competition. This is my sister. This is my brother. We're not jockeying up and above. Oh, this is not fringe, okay? This is not fringe. This is science. We need to put science in the center of our organizations. And the Army's been the leader doing this. The army for three years has built what started as a spiritual readiness pilot and became the spiritual readiness initiative. The science in the awakened brain was read by the chief, the vice chief, the secretary of the army, the four stars. They said, yes, this is, this is very familiar. And in fact, one of the one who runs at that time ran one of the major training installations, hundreds of thousands of soldiers looked at all the science and said, there's not a single thing here that surprises me. And then they used the science of spirituality, mental health, renewal, recovery, prevention, and resilience to make institutional transformation. So that now in basic training, a soldier must be fit a body, mind, and spirit in a way that is in inclusive, like ISH, constitutional. Behavioral health now has a standing universal chaplain with whom they work together. I'm sure you've done this already for years as a treatment team. Post-traumatic spiritual growth groups that have as their access, spiritual growth foundationally to reverse spiritual injury shown to be concomitant with level on the PCL of symptoms of trauma. This is our birthright. This is who we are. Every institution no longer can be separate from inner spiritual life, separate from relational spiritual values. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're getting applause here and I'm sure uh, even on the screen, I can see it. Do you need to shift this far? So I'm it's going, oh, yes, I'm going to come back. Hello. Uh, there we go. If you would, in your own line, uh, raise your hand. And John Allen, I see you. And, and each one of you have an opportunity to speak. John, go ahead and say something. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lisa. This is magnificent. I want to uh, go to the connection you made between spirituality and love. I'll try to be very brief about this. I've been interested in relational trauma, 
the essence of which is feeling alone and invisible in excruciating pain. So the alone part is the critical part. Now, I've been writing about trust, and now I'm thinking about writing about care in psychotherapy. And I, what I'm zeroing in on is the feeling of connection, mm. which is crucial. So I make a triangle here with two people, okay? Dyadic, I'm thinking of spirituality and dyads. Two people connected in a feeling of connection, we. So we have separateness and togetherness. Now I've come to believe that there really is something between people. And the only concept I can come up with for understanding what's between people, the connection, is spirituality. There's, there's no, I think there really is something there, but it's not tangible. Well, maybe it is kind of tangible. Anyway, so that's what I'm thinking about. And I'm relating to your connection between love and spirituality. I'm, of course, this can be more broadly transcendent, but there's something transcendent, I think, in dyads making this connection. And so I'm wondering about love. I mean, these two are totally and a cultural uh, antithesis of this is autonomy, praising autonomy. And this is what patients learn, that they need to be self-reliant, self-sufficient, manage their distress on their own, and it goes against what's most needed. Anyway, that's my reaction to what you've said. John, always so deep and wise. It is such a joy to see you and feel feel your ideas. Um, I have some notes of science to perhaps <clears throat> catch in the mirror, some of what you're sharing. Um, sure. There's two points. And the first I think is perhaps most directly related, which is we looked around the world. We looked in India, China, and in the US. If the natural capacity for relational spirituality, our natural docking station is innate, it should have some common phenotypes irrespective of the two thirds formation so that the world is rich and beautifully diverse. And we have many different ethnic and religious traditions and there's one spiritual brain and we all have it. We might strengthen it to various degrees. We might have human variability as we do in our capacity to engage with music, but there's one foundational spiritual brain and we all have it. And so what are those phenotypes? What do they look like? And we identified at least five they won't surprise you. Two of them are perceptual and squarely fit with the awakened brain. The capacity to perceive love as a mutative force, not just an emotion like happiness, but as a profound and sacred transformative force, love. India, China, US, everyone perceives love as more than an emotion. And at the perceptual level, the parietal, that we are distinct and we are one that what we do right here in this beautiful meeting has everything to do with us and five miles away and 500 and 5,000 miles away concomitantly superposition of consciousness, right? So we are a point and we are a wave. Okay, everyone's got that India, China, US, unit of love. There's an on-ramp to that awareness, prayer, meditation, mind, body, and an off-ramp of values derived from ultimate reality, not cherry picked like in Sunni Luther's sample of highly resourced transactional high schools. Right? On ramp, awakened awareness, values derived and lived. The fifth phenotype was the most profoundly associated, the most robustly statistically associated with the red brain, with the level of cortical thickness across the spiritual brain. And it was love of neighbor love of neighbor. When we love each other, it is sacred. And every faith tradition knows this to be true. When we love each other, that what you describe as between people is spiritual. Love is spiritual. Thank you. Thank you for helping. Uh, me. I've asked Jim Lomax if he would uh, have a comment. Yeah, there are so many things, Lisa, that I'd like to talk with you about in your, uh, from your talk. But I guess I'm uh, especially concerned about our time. It's of so good to see you. 
Good to it's see so you. Good to see you. I, I am concerned about our national and international divisiveness, which is either an awful lot greater now than it has been, or we're so much more aware of it. And specifically in connection to your religion, spirituality, shadow overlap, are there religious cognitions and beliefs which make spiritual uh, attachments and uh, transcendent spirituality more difficult? And uh, what Hargament calls the downside of sanctification. When you sanctify certain beliefs, there's a downside to it that can be pretty extreme and lead to a lot of violence. But are, do you, what do you, how do you think about that? And what, if anything, can we do about this, the beliefs that are toxic for our society and community? Thank you, Jim. And put so beautifully and eloquently, your question already a priori frames the core point, which is that our innate spirituality is a seat through which we perceive that we are loved, held, guided, and never alone, and through which we show up for one another to be loving, holding, guiding, and never leave anyone alone. And as you so eloquently articulated your point, what is it about some cultural or religious or any other form of understanding that might interfere with our natural spiritual awareness? And I'm, here I'm going to have to hand it over to people who know more about the broad range of um, articulations of various faith traditions. But I will say that through the lens of science, through the lens of science, a young child, let me put it this way. We looked at children of opiate addicts. What rate of opiate addicts do you think have us to say, I turn to God for guidance, my spirituality in the throes of being opiate addicts, not in recovery? 4%, 96% of opiate addicts do not say my personal spirituality is highly important to me. Ergo, the suffering, right? And we looked at their children who were mean age 11. The children were not at 4%. The children were at about 35%, which is half the national rate, but it's not 4%. And so we looked a little closer at those children as you know, the intergenerational transmission of addiction is quite strong. So we're watching the train headed towards a wreck, right? What's gonna intercede? What's gonna change course as that train plows along? Well, it turns out that when the child became concordant with a loving, steady adult, whether it was a grandparent or a committed aunt or uncle or older sibling, there was concordance with the healthiest form of spiritual life, which is to say that form of spiritual life that was most aligned with being loved, held, guided, and never alone. That form which was most protective against addiction. How much so? The intergenerational concordance, passing the torch, of healthy spirituality between the child of someone struggling with severe addiction and a loving, committed adult. It could be the partner again, the grandparent, who both walks the walk and explains, talks the walk of spiritual life, walks the values and explains and strengthens the natural perception, was 90% against picking up alcohol and drugs, against heavy use of alcohol and drugs. Mean age 11, of course, is the gateway to the lifetime course of addiction. So right at the gateway. So when we know this, you know, what, what do you want more? If I'm an addict and I have a child, I want to drop her off at a faith community. I want her to go there with grandma or my best friend who's committed to years through which they become the person who walks the walk and talks the walk. Because the intergenerational transmission of spiritual life, the two thirds embrace is such that the child seems to demonstrate selective spiritual socialization. Ding, 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 ding. They turn to the healthiest, most loving, most true and protective form of spirituality in their entire range of opportunity. So we do know the difference. 
And the other piece of data is that right during the surge, the 50% increase in the heritable contribution, the biological clock, the hunger for truth and transcendence, we are exquisitely attuned to truth and hypocrisy. You know, teenagers will say, you know, why is it that the people at our house of worship, you know, they, they, they're very keen on when the walk and the talk don't align, right? Well, this is wonderful, right? I mean, I, I'll share with you. I took some a few years ago, I took my two daughters to see a musical they'd wanted to see. And it was um, Hamilton and they'd waited and waited and we went and we saw Hamilton and it was, you know, much more than I could afford. And there we were. And on the way out the door, my younger child, deeply moving. She saw a homeless man suffering there on the street. And she said, mother, this is wrong. Everyone just watched the show and they're walking right by the homeless man. We're going to go back. We're going to help him. And we did. For the next three weeks, I didn't hear a peep about Hamilton. I heard what was important in the day. The teenager knows what's important. What was important was the gentleman, right? So they, you know, the title that I went with originally was Hushing the Mystic. It became the spiritual child. But I think that the young adult, the adolescent is the mystic in our culture. So to your point, we know the difference. We know the difference. And yet at that vulnerable moment, we do go shopping if nothing good is available. And when you think about the pathways to extremism, and the relevance to extremism. There's a hunger and there's a vulnerability to a false guide because we want to know the meaning and truth more than anything. It is the most important work and it's what we're hardwired to pursue. Wow, yes. thank you so much. Donald, uh, I wondered if Don Moss might have anything to say. One thing I would appreciate is that Many universities don't talk about spirituality, but at Saybrook University, it is an element that is welcomed and is not uh, displaced. So I just wanted to hear what Don might have to say. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And, and thank you, uh, Lisa. This was absolutely remarkable. I really appreciate it. Um, just to answer John's question to me, um, Saybrook, or particularly our College of Integrated Medicine and Health Sciences was founded as with the mission to develop a mind, body and spirit approach. Early on, we frequently used the phrase mind, body medicine and our students objected and said, that doesn't sound like it includes the spirit, where's the spirit? Now we intended for it to include the spirit, but now we more often say body, mind and spirit. Now, question for you. Um, you, your, re, your lecture today was remarkable. I've been aware of research, especially in the area of meditation, and this research has been coming out for 20 years. Sarah Lazar did early research on cortical thickening, with, uh, which correlated with how many hours of meditation have been taking place. And there was similar research on our chromosomes, showing that the telomeres are enhanced with extensive absorption in meditation. So this is very encouraging for our, our physical health and our well-being. Today, you took this into a much more direct collision with the crises of our time, the crises of adolescence, the crises in mental health, the crises in misdevelopment, you know, focus, greater focus on cruelty, uh, enhancing popularity or substance use, enhancing popularity. But the tough question I want to ask you and see what ideas you have, how do you think we might use the understanding of the connection between the brain and these developments and our spirituality? How can we better use this knowledge to address our crises? Thank you. And first of all, I'm so grateful for your leadership in this field and all of the people you're seeding our society with who are going to be spiritually supportive. So that's underway. That, that is a solution. In, in my view, I think the science is a blueprint, a roadmap for relational transformation 
in our lives, to be authorized to speak in our coming and going at the most profound spiritual level and change our public square so that we now welcome back the spiritual core. When we threw out religion, we accidentally threw out the spiritual baby with the bathwater. And we now have a generation and a half that is spiritually non-conversant. They don't know the difference between spirituality and religion. I'll explain it for an hour. And then by the water cooler, they ask, you know, it, it's, and they're very smart people. They, there's just not a lived familiarity. I was on a I've been on a number of APA leadership committees. I was on an ethics board once where people, um, everyone else in the room referred to what I would call observant as inherently extreme. These were psychologists, right? So they aren't bad people. They spend all day trying to help people. We're spiritually non-conversant and not knowledgeable. And this is something that can change when we re-enliven our public square in all of the leadership positions you hold. I mean, you're dying, you're running a whole program. If everyone in their own professional band reconnects their own spiritual voice and gives others permission to do the same, then we will be back into a culture of relational spirituality. The second thing we lost when we threw the spiritual baby out with the bathwater was we lost pluralism. And you are magnificent, ISH, at pluralism. And Houston's excellent at pluralism. I've been to events where everyone's on the edge of their chair. They can't wait to figure out how to be helpful to their fellow brothers and sisters and side by side from all different faith traditions. Well, I want to hear about Christmas and I want to tell you about Passover or Hanukkah. And I want her to tell me about Diwali. I, I, and how do we know? We don't just nod respectfully, but no of what each other speak when a baby's born or an ancestor crosses. It's from our common universal seat of spiritual awareness. It's, I think spiritual multilingualism is not just you know respect, it is a deep knowing in the heart of what is meant by crossing over at, at the end of life. And in fact, a child is born and less socialized out of it, perceiving continuity of consciousness or spirit after death perceiving that we can know without being told that we're naturally tapping into direct knowing child knows this. So I don't think it would take that much to bring back our spiritual voice. If we simply choose to do it, that's the first thing. The second thing is the institutions where we live and grow and do our work can be authorized by leadership, real leadership, like you here to authorize, give voice to the spiritual core. So in the past, because of the crisis, in the past year, I've given um, scientific talks to Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, Rochester Medical School, Harvard Business School, Columbia Business School. Everyone is looking and it takes about, it's this close to the surface. Yes, we say that here. Yes, we talk about our relationship to God in a way that's inclusive and universal and takes each person in a soldier-centered, student-centered, professional-centered, authorized in their own free expression of their natural spirituality. So this, this was very, very well ironed out by the army. And it sounded like this. Um, JAG, the army's legal wing, saw this work, the Spiritual Readiness Initiative, to be 100% legal and constitutional as part of the free expression clause. Because the general or the company commander or the drill sergeant is not saying, hey, soldier, believe like me. They're saying, how's your spiritual core? And what does your spiritual core have to say about what happened out there today where two of us died? It is only at that level that that can be processed. So a way back, I think, um, is very Jeffersonian, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator the birth of pluralism, that among these unalienable rights are life, liberty. So liberty is a spiritual right. And you probably know Jefferson's first draft said, we hold these truths to be sacred, that all men were created equal and independent. So our, not, our country is a spiritual place and we've been populated with spiritual people, but to welcome back the many voices that in a dynamic make us whole again.
Um, Lisa, we have some clinicians in the group right here on the screen. If they would wish to share, raise your hand, please go ahead. Uh, Sheila? I can't hear you. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Dr. Miller. That was fantastic. I work in the VA systems, so I'm actually with a group which is different from yours in the sense that I'm taking care of older adults because my job is geriatric psychiatry. So I'm going to bring you back to your own graph with a question. You know, you had the, yes. The umbrella. And I saw the post-traumatic growth sharply fall off once the PCLC hits about 60, 65. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what I'm seeing. I'm seeing among the Vietnam vets and among the Korean War vets, now the Korean War have mostly, you know, sort of um, age-wise, they're sort of phasing out because they're passing away, the Vietnam vets. It seems to me that when trauma is too much, just too much, that the post-traumatic growth does fall off. And I'm seeing that clinically too. So I buy into that graph. I believe that. So my question is, your work is a lot about the younger adults, which is spiritual readiness, right? So, and you also talked about the opioid um, addiction and the kids of the, those who are addicted to opioids. And it seemed like when you were talking about them, you were talking about people who had um, not enough support and they looked, they were almost questing or searching for a nearly available adult of any discipline, any kind related or not related who would, you called it talk the walk, right? Yes. So my question is, that is at that phase of the trajectory, right? The ascending phase of the trajectory in the sense that this is spiritual readiness. So what about the descending phase? What about this group? Mm -hmm. They Are they are they now the opposite of mystic? Are they cynic, cynics? Because I'm seeing cynics. I'm seeing lots of cynicism. I'm seeing lots of anger. I'm seeing spiritual anger and distrust and feeling like you've been let down. So do you have anything to say to that? Like what, what does yeah. one do? Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> and I've spoken a few times for the VA and in the VA in DC and the convening. Of, and I, I, I think that spiritually integrated treatment might, you know, as you're doing right here now at ISH, mm -hmm. be made available and you may already be doing in the VA at every step in the road. Because very often there are people who've been in treatment a very long time and haven't once been invited what does your spiritual core say was there do you feel you know, your higher power whether it's jesus or spirit or god you feel them in your, you know, opening up that awareness um david rosemarin at i gave grand rounds at harvard mclean and he came up with a lovely thing everyone who walks in the door david rosemarin you probably know one of our colleagues in this group is spiritual and spirituality and religion important to you does it have something to do with what's going on now? Mm -hmm. And would you like to engage around it? Mm -hmm. And the army picked that up very, very quickly. You know, and, and I want to be very clear. I happen to have zeroed in on a period in life because the translation from basic science to institutional transformation has been so strong. And right now, you know, there is actual traction. But of course. It is a life course event. And the data is very clear that again at midlife, I could have been quite spiritually engaged my whole life. And in fact, the more spiritually engaged I am at midlife, the deeper the developmental depression for act two, the second half of life, as Jung would have said. So the more soulful, you know, the, of all of the personality is independent of spiritual awareness of our awakened brain, except for one dimension which is openness to experience of the big five, right? So, you know, whether I'm inward or outward, introverted, extroverted, while I'm tightly wound or laid back, that's pretty independent of the capacity to perceive the transcendent relationship, except for the one personality trait of openness to experience. So when we go through phases of developmental growth, spiritual growth, coming of age and again at midlife. We have nicknames that don't begin to do this justice. Sophomore slump, midlife crisis. It is actually the opportunity of our lifetime to deepen. Okay, how have I spent my life? What is God showing me now in this rather big bump in the road? You know, I lost the one thing to which I was most attached. Funny that, right? 
but there's a continuity yeah. between inner and outer. I'm afraid all my life, what if I weren't rich and I lose my money? I'm afraid all my life, what if my partner cheats and he has enough, like the thing we don't want happens. And it is actually a moment of spiritual opportunity alongside mm-hmm. the pain. Well, if we as an individual, like 90% of people in our field are open to experience, then at these moments of transition, we feel things even more profoundly. And the work is that much more. Our therapists, our musicians, our pastor, priest, Amon, rabbi, it, this is this is who we are. Oh. So I guess to answer your question, Let's let's put it in every decade of life and know that there's a map that continues. And of course, elderhood is the third major act, right? Spiritual growth in three acts. And that and of course life events can precipitate it along the way, but developmentally in three acts. And it would I would wonder if they're going through a time of deep spiritual growth and struggle underneath that. What was um, it was it in you? Know, Lisa, we have, as you know, a connection with the Menninger Clinic here in Houston, and Terry Harrell is uh, in the addiction department, and I wanted her just to reflect. Uh, As I understand, the Menninger started out very spiritual, and I've often questioned whether that's still there, but I want to see what, uh, what, Terry, what what would you have to share? Here, excuse me, Carrie, excuse me. Hi, Lisa. Hi, so nice to see you. Oh, so nice to see you. I'm always so grateful to hear you talk. I'm, you know, as a psychologist at the Menninger Clinic, I work with the young adults and with uh, the adolescents and working with people right as they're coming in from suicide attempts, overdoses. I, I just completely echo the idea that this is a pandemic that is incredibly powerful. And, you know, one of the thoughts on, uh, on my mind, unfortunately, I'm, I'm probably not speaking that much to addictions in this idea, but I wanted to go back to something um, that Dr. Lomax mentioned, which is sort of the divisiveness. One thing that I've noticed, uh, and I also specialize in working with LGBTQ young people, is that the there is such a connection between religion and spirituality at sort of like a, a gut level and because so often that some of the trauma they've experienced has been religious in nature, that the there is a pushback from anything spiritual. Um, I can't tell if we're frozen. Are we frozen? We're good. Okay, great, great. Um, so yeah, the the idea that you know, especially the young people I'm working with who've experienced a religious trauma, or they have pretty significant religious shame, I find they are the people who are most aversive to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. They don't want to engage in meditation, mindfulness, yoga, because there's such a connection between spirituality and religion. And again, in this sort of trauma reaction way, there's this huge pushback of, I don't want anything to do with religion at all, including then spirituality. Um, And again, I see this as, as such a part of the problem as religion societally continues to be associated with values of centered campus and i would say it's extremely sorry to converse in oh. can you hear me our internet I cut out you, right terrific uh, and in my can you hear us Can you hear us okay? 100%. You sound beautiful. Okay. So uh, much of the air and water of this campus, the Columbia and Barnard campus, there is latent radical materialism. And what we found was when we posted just on the undergraduate campus, a spiritual mind, S came first, a spiritual mind body program awakened awareness it's an eight week way in the language of life to reignite the deep authentic relationship with the transcendent relationship now i'll be the first to say god joins who god wants to join we create the conditions under which people are prepared to be in relationship with their higher power and what we found in offering awakened awareness again a spiritual mind body group was that the rate at which the gender and sexual minority students signed up was twofold that of everybody else. 
So there were a great number of gender and sexual minority students who maybe had not felt welcome in their childhood house of worship. Um, and instead of go down the street and find a different one, they'd thrown the whole thing out, right? So rather than seek and find, they had met messengers that didn't walk the walk and had spiritual injury. How much so? 40% of the college students at Columbia and Barnard seeking a spiritual group, a spiritual wellness group, reported spiritual injury. There was a time in my life where I felt closer to God. There was a time in my life where I felt more worthy, more able to pray than I do now. And awareness, there was another time, 40% seeking, I think, spiritual renewal, or at least the reversal of spiritual injury. And what we found was that at time one, undergraduates on the Columbia and Barnard campus to seek a spiritual, we can, I'll send this out to you and we've got it published. It's an open trial. I think that controlled trials are actually unethical in this area. Um, we sent it out. Well, the gender and sexual minority students not only engaged at a higher rate, they improved even more than everybody else. Now, if they happen to bring up issues around being gender, sexual minority, that's fine. But the group was about universal awakening, our natural birthright for awakened awareness. I think that much too much of the intervention has focused on the point and not the wave, has focused on a random universe and not a connected, loving, guiding universe. And while it is important to know who we are, it's also important to know who we are in relationship to God or life and who we are to one another as sister and brothers. And it was the gender and sexual minority students who got the most out of awakening relational spirituality and reclaiming their birthright. They showed greater reduction on the PCL and symptoms of trauma. They showed greater reduction in the sense of isolation and an increase in belonging and connectedness. And when it was directly measured as the potential leverage point, they showed greater awakening, greater awakened awareness and greater reversal of spiritual injury. Everybody benefited along those dimensions, but they benefited even more. So I think that when we can offer spiritual support, it is so um, transformative and needed. And they would say things like, you know, awakened awareness is my family. It, it wasn't my hope to create groupies. I want them to go out into the world, right? <laughs> but they had an experience of being loved and seen and held. And I can share with you and some of the practices that, you know, that they did, for instance, they invited their higher self to speak to the person across from theirs, higher self, you know, things like that. Or I could do a practice at the end that, that was, um, I think I may have shared with you before, it was a practice that was a gift, a real gift. I taught a class for, at that point, 10, now 20 years here at Columbia on spiritual awareness and awakening. And I, about 10 years ago, had really wanted a way, you know, I'm waiting around for synchronicity. I'm waiting around for the, the wave comes, but I'm waiting. And I thought, could we increase the welcoming conditions of spiritual awareness? And right as I was hoping so much, we could increase the conditions. I went to a talk out in Lake, standing, you know, there and presenting numbers on the screen. I looked out over the auditorium and in the very back row was a gentleman in his probably mid seventies and his wife who beamed the most powerful love, John, to your point, such a powerful love. I could almost see it with my mind's eye and I certainly felt it. I mean, that's, that's welcoming. That's hostile, but it's such a love. So at the end of the talk, I walked right up to him. His name was Dr. Gary Weaver and he worked for 36 years with court referred boys and in particular the boys that no one wanted to work with third time for the judge in salt lake a boy had a choice you go to adult prison or you have one last chance you can go with dr weaver out into the moab <laughs> and when it was put that way the boys went out into the moab the first thing they learned is that no one's left behind we're not there we don't cook our food we don't go to bed until everyone's gotten here relationally, like the army. And then he did a practice that awakened their natural birthright. And it's a 90 second practice in the language of life that I'd love to share with you 
perhaps in your own path, but if you're ever trying to help someone who maybe did have spiritual injury to reconnect directly through their birthright. Yeah? Yes, please. Yes, okay. I'd love it. Great. I do this in honor of who taught me, Dr. Gary Weaver. I'm going to invite you to clear out your inner space. Take five breaths, clear out your inner space. I invite you to set before you a table. This is your table. And to your table, you may invite anyone living or deceased who truly has your best interest in mind. Anybody living or deceased who truly has your best interest in mind. And with them all sitting there, ask them if they love you. And now you may invite your higher self, the part of you that is so much more than anything that you've done or not done, anything you may have or not have, your true eternal higher self. and ask you if you love you. And now finally, you may invite your higher power, whatever your word, however you know, your higher power, and ask them if they love you. Ask them if they love you. And now with all of those people sitting there right now, what do they need to share? What do they need to tell you now? What do they need to share so that you know? What do you need to know? When you're ready, I'll invite you back. This is your counsel and they are always there for you. Who shows up may change depending on where we are in our journey and we can ask what's on our heart. This is your birthright. No one can ever take this away from you. This is your innate awakened awareness. I shared that in Germany on an inpatient unit and a young man sitting next to me turned next to me and he said, you know, I'm very relieved that that can't be taken away because I've been terribly mistreated and I'm traumatized. He said, you know, to me in English, but to know that that's mine is very reassuring. Lisa, we, we have to thank you for your time. You have blessed us all. And uh, I, I just want to say, it began with the question from John Allen about connecting love with what you had to say. And it ended with that beautiful invitation that we can take to everyone in our families and to our patients, to anyone, and invite them for that 90-second exposure to love. And you're absolutely right. There is love in this universe for all of us. So thank you. 
Thank you so much for being with us today. And also for all of you that joined us uh, online, I think next time we'll do it where we're all online, then we can all see all of our faces all of the time. But I want to just uh, say this has been a unique and precious time to be together. So thank you again, Lisa. Thank you. And for to all of you, me. goodbye. I'm so grateful to be part of our group. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. There are clamps. Thank you all for being present. And I'm sorry we don't have time to hear from each one of you this time, but we'll do this in a different different setting. And uh, I, I, I just couldn't stop it. It was too rich, too wonderful, too beautiful. We no, needed it. Stay. We, needed stay. it. we needed all of it. Stay. So thank you, Lisa. Much love. Bye bye everybody. Bye bye. You want me to shut it? You can send me in. Yeah, no, you can close it.